An escape mechanism is a release process by which the individual reduces pressure within his own nature by some activity or avocational interest. Escape mechanisms can be both constructive and destructive. But when the individual suffering from intense pressure seeks escapes, he very likely makes his condition worse inasmuch as his escapes are as irrational as the conditions that brought about his pressures. The world as we know it now is a monument to man's escape mechanisms. The restlessness, the confusion, the false directives which dominate our activities all add up to the human being trying to run away from himself. He has the belief that he can, if he can get his mind off of himself, he will then achieve inner tranquility. That if he can simply ignore his responsibilities, they will disappear. Unfortunately, this does not happen. Instead of disappearing, these difficulties multiply. Because for every problem, there must be a correct solution. And until that solution is found, the problem lingers on, no matter how we may feel about the problem. The individual, by nature and by endowments, is a comparatively happy creature. If he does not ruin his own life, he can live rather well. While it is true that living is made up of lights and shadows, pleasures and pains, joys and sorrows, most individuals are adjusted to this concept. They accept it whether it is valid or not. They accept it because they have to. Unless they take a much stronger control of their own conduct than is likely, these patterns of probabilities will endure, and the person will be moved along the path of his lifetime with the lights and shadows much the same as in the lives of those around him. The main problem that we all have to solve some way is how to carry the normal activities of life with a reasonable degree of dignity. We have to accept good fortune with modesty and ill fortune with courage or patience. But the person may not be at all inclined to modesty. He may not be especially courageous, and the chances are he will be completely impatient. Thus, instead of approaching life's conditions and situations with a relaxed internal life, he comes to face the difficulties of the day with exaggerated attitudes and more or less ruthless determinations to do as he pleases. Religion has always tried to help man to find the consolation of faith in time of stress. And regardless of whether we accept a certain faith or not, whether we 
join ourselves to one religious group or another, there still remains the influence of religion upon the inner life of the person. One of the things that religion should give us <coughs> is a sense of duty, for nearly all religions teach that we must meet our obligations honorably. The sense of duty means that we have things to face, and we must face them according to the principles or convictions that are deepest and most real in our own natures. It becomes obvious that wherever religion ceases to exercise a powerful influence, the individual is deprived of the religious resource in his own nature. It does not really mean too much to try to prove or disprove any religious doctrine. The idea that we gain something by mentally uh, tearing down our own faith or someone else's is essentially false and has a great deal of cruelty in it if this other person's beliefs or our own are essentially noble. The great pressure of today is increasing because the individual is not moved uh, to recognize any source of strength superior to himself and to which he is accountable for his own conduct. The various activities of groups such as Alcoholics Anonymous indicate the beneficial result of the individual believing that the universe is good and that a power of good will work through him and with him if he will keep faith with this power. We know from thousands of years of human experience that the individual is impoverished so far as his conduct is concerned, to the degree that he loses faith in something more important than himself. For the last 50 years, mankind, especially Western man, has been losing faith. He has been losing it continuously. It has been eroded away by sophistication and intellectualism. As his faith became less, his problems became greater. The relationship between the two processes is so obvious that it is scarcely necessary uh, to examine it. We know from our own experiences that unless we have some hope some courage or some conviction, it is almost impossible to withstand the pressures of circumstances. Now what are the pressures of circumstances? They are the pressures against us by individuals whose faith is no greater than our own. Circumstances become worse around us as the faiths of other people weaken. In the end, we live in a very dangerous world in which we are practically reverting to savagery. The difference between the savage and the civilized person is his internal code. The savage probably in many instances has at least a conviction that his savagery is proper. He knows no better. But civilized man has not even this um, satisfaction or consolation. He cannot believe uh, that his ignorance is necessary or that his sophistication is inevitable. It is something that he cultivates. 
something which he regards as a valuable status symbol in a time when skepticism is fashionable. Some come also to the destruction or at least the innervation of their inner resources by simple indifference. They are not actually non-believers, but they give no energy to their beliefs. Their beliefs are simply what we would term nominal. They will give a half-hearted yes uh, to questions involving moral proprieties. But they are not inclined to inconvenience themselves to preserve their own personal integrity. If the person cannot find refuge in value, there is only the possibility of escaping into something else. The wise man, the religious person, in difficulty, retires into his own nature, not through frustration or introversion, but because within himself is a strength, and by reestablishing contact with his own strength, he is encouraged and sustained in his effort to be victorious over unfortunate circumstances. If, however, he turns into himself and finds that no strength is there, that in the process of his education or his development of a career, there has been no dependency upon inner resource. There has been no calling upon strength. If strength is not used, it is not readily available. If the individual has lost faith or never developed it, faith is not immediately available simply because he may suddenly in desperation call upon it. This brings us to a very important element in mysticism. For part of mysticism consists of establishing within the self the concept of a transcendent being. The person must have some clear definition of his own inner nature, what its principles are, what its powers are, what its resources are. He must also have some inner realization that it is possible for him uh, to be that which he earnestly and sincerely desires to be. He can accomplish this whether his desires are constructive or destructive. But if they are destructive, he simply gets himself into further difficulty. It is better, therefore, that each person has within himself an archetype of what a human being should be and that this archetype should not depend entirely upon the habiliments of externals. The individual whose idea of what he should be is simply to be more popular, more ambitious, and more successful in his material life is not building any kind of archetype that has any meaning in it. It is no source of strength to him. A true archetype must always be an image of a state superior to the present toward which the individual aspires. In other words, the archetype must invite growth. It must impel the person to improve to become more than he is. But this improvement must not be interpreted only in terms of physical welfare. It is hardly necessary for him to think too much of physical welfare any longer. The state is going to take care of that. 
But this prospect brings very little happiness with it. Because this is not the kind of welfare with which we are really concerned. Very few persons actually believe they are going to starve to death. However, welfare in its better sense implies well-being. And well-being always has to have a plan, a purpose, a vision, a goal and, of course, a method of attaining these ends. We cannot have any strong image of progress for ourselves unless we have ideals, convictions, or dedications. An ideal is simply an image of a superior self or a superior state of self. It is the recognition that we can be better, not merely the hope that the world is going to be better. Convictions are strength of character. They remind us that these things which we deeply and truly believe and toward which we are willing to labor can almost certainly be accomplished. Conviction, therefore, encourages us from the examples of others who have attained to noble state. By examples of achievement in creativity in all its fields, the musician who does not wish to be a better musician tomorrow than he is today will be a worse musician tomorrow. The artist, who is perfectly satisfied with his achievement, dies at the moment satisfaction sets in. The egotist, who is convinced that there is nothing more that he can attain in life in terms of character than that which he already possesses, has completely frustrated his own existence. In life, nothing stands still. The person becomes better or worse. And if he becomes worse and remains that way long enough, nature simply removes him from the scene. Nature will not permit an indefinite downhill slide on the part of mankind. And nations which become decadent are like individuals who become decadent. Decadence is nothing but the loss of purposes, the loss of ideals, the loss of goals, and the loss of the sense that it is possible for us to achieve. To try to counteract this type of situation, most persons in their dilemmas or in their misfortunes have a tendency to call upon their older or earlier religious training. In this generation in which we live now, there are considerable numbers of older persons who can remember back uh, to a more secure early life. Not secure in terms of opulence, but secure in terms of value. These older persons had earlier religious training. Many of them came from devout families. Others perhaps came from free-thinking families. But this free-thinking was serious. The liberal was still a dedicated person. These same individuals grew up in a world in which religious values were firm and clear, and the code of life was simple and essentially honest. While it is true that many years have passed, since these persons experienced the full uh, force of their earlier training, there is another circumstance in life that is notable. As we grow older, we have a tendency to move backward into our own earlier living. The convictions that sustained us in childhood will largely protect us in old age. We may have neglected and ignored them for many years, but they are part of the subconscious. 
A simple example of something of this nature can be found in language and in music. A person who as a child spent a few years learning a foreign language may not use it for most of his life. But in later years he will find that with a little effort he can brush up the remembrance of it and can proceed with it. A person learning to play the piano in childhood may not touch it after they pass out of their teenage years. But at 60 or 65 this ability is not entirely gone and with a little effort it can be revived. The same is true of characteristics and conditionings. So that today the greatest strength that our society really has is the strength and courage of these older persons who still have foundations upon hard rock. Perhaps some of them are a little narrow, some are a little bigoted, but still all in all they are a dedicated group of persons well aware of the importance of duty. While these remain, uh, they will add a certain stability to society. But as they drop out, society is going to lose its living contact with these older foundations. Young people coming along have no such stability. They have no basic foundation in anything except constant change and motion. Even in physical things, this is a little difficult. Some years ago, uh, I made a little research on this project because of a number of persons who came in with difficulties. And one family that came in had lived in the same house, in the same community for several generations. Uh, in this same symbolism, they had developed tremendous sense of integration. They were part of something. Uh, they had a certain strength within themselves, a kind of an immovable quality. Some of it was perhaps not completely desirable, but it did give them a kind of foundation on which to build a memory of things that endured, of lives that went on, of patterns that completed themselves. Back in this generation uh, there were archetypes and they became set in the minds of those who grew up in these patterns. I remember one younger person who came to me not long afterwards. This person was about 17 years old. In 17 years his family had moved 22 times. He had no sense of home, no concept of continuity. He might just as well have been brought up in a hotel. The family did not move because it had to, but because the family was dominated by an escape mechanism. The family became bored. The family had to live on constant innovation. Only about three months ago, I had a young man in to see me who had not been able to complete one single semester in the same school. Now part of this was due to inevitable circumstances. His parents uh, were engaged in a line of activity in which they had to move with the business. But some of the moves were also quite arbitrary and unnecessary. This individual had nothing of an experience of becoming firmly established anywhere. Now it is quite possible that this person could have gained a positive lesson from this instability. He could have recognized the inevitable and eternal motions of life. He could have realized that his own little experience is probably the experience of the end of all mankind, for we are always moving from here to there to somewhere. 
But unfortunately, nothing had been given to him to help him to orient in this atmosphere of motion. He was just completely confused. He could have no friends. He was never in any place long enough to actually observe the normal operations of cause and effect. He was moved about so rapidly that he was totally confused, unable to visualize any kind of a continuity in the future. So the new generation growing up has very little religious stability. It has very little sense of the importance of duty. It has not realized from experience the dedication of family to the protection of itself. He had no, they had no clear insight of the long, difficult years of bringing up young people and the dedication that was necessary on the part of the parents to give their children a good start in life. This dedication being non-existent for most youngsters today, uh, they do not have any proper respect for unselfishness or self-sacrifice. All adds up to one rather simple but dramatic fact that we are coming to the end of a generation in which stability can even be livingly remembered. Young people of today are beginning to show the signs of age with a memory that does not go back further than World War I. Many of them have no memory behind the Depression years, and some count their lives from Pearl Harbor. These young people have never known national, personal, family securities. What, then, could have supplied them with inner strength? All that was left was some means provided by society for this purpose. But society itself has been in utter confusion as far back as these young people can remember. They have received no special instruction in education, or in even, even in religion, for the most part, by which they could strengthen uh, their inner values. Education could have done a great deal for them, because in the impressionable years, an education made it seem important to these young people to develop ethics, to develop sense of responsibility, they would have developed these values and remembered them just as easily as they remembered the multiplication table, and many youngsters today can't even remember that. But a generation that cannot spell, cannot add, has a great deal of difficulty in reading, and has never been taught to seek beneath the surface of living for any value is going to have trouble when outside troubles begin to gather. As they have proceeded, some of these younger people have from family, and occasionally a fortunate association, begun to realize their own needs. Probably the first awakening for the average young person of today is when they find themselves about to raise a family of their own. Young parents are concerned about the questions that their children have asked or will ask. Most parents would like their children to have strength of character that they as parents do not possess. They would like to save their children's sorrow. They would like their children to have what they do not have. Fifty years ago, that meant wealth. Today, it is beginning to mean value. Value in the sense of inner strength. So in this crisis, 
younger people look around, and I know a number of them that have made church associations, who have read up the subject as much as they could, have taken adult education courses, have consulted their physicians and counselors and analysts, not so much because of the desperation of their own need, as because they wanted to be able to give something of value to these children for whom they have a real and natural affection. Others who do not have this much basic stamina or uh, insight are gradually turning into very bad parents. They are merely burdened by children. And they have nothing in their memories to remind them of the joys and pleasures of self-sacrifice in order to bring happiness and security to those they love. This situation cannot be vitalized because they've never experienced it. Thus, by degrees, society is moving from all of its older foundations uh, to a situation in which inner resource is almost totally absent. Uh, take a young college family of today. Both of the adults are college graduates. They expect beyond doubt that their children will also be college graduates in due time. Uh, these are good people. They are not very secure. Who is these times? But what are these young people really doing? The man, perhaps, is working. He is in some business or profession for which his education has prepared him. He is liable to be foundering around in this himself, making fairly good money but suffering from continuous dissatisfaction. The wife is a college-bred woman, if the children have not yet arrived, she is very likely to be working herself. <coughs> what are they working for? Down payment on a house. The possibility of more and better furniture. Uh, the desire to have an up-to-date car. A new television. Most of these young people have no concept whatever of repairing, mending, or putting together anything. The moment it shows the slightest weakness or sign of age, it is thrown away. There is very little resourcefulness in these younger people. And as a typical family of young college graduates, there is only a fair possibility that they may be at all religious. They are religious, yes, in a sense. They would prefer to be honest. They would like to admit that they believe in the existence of God. But these are not dynamic things. The dynamic things are the television and the car and the plans for the weekend and the celebration of various anniversaries and events. The rest of their lives may be de des described as rather shallow, not much real thinking. In the house of such a young couple, you will find very few good books. Most of the things that you will find are the popular sellers of the day, preferably in paperback. You will not find in these homes any good art. This young family may be earning, the two of them working, from $1,500 to $2,000 a month. Yet there is very little to indicate any solid interest in culture. What cultural instinct they have seems to be largely devoted to modernistic furnishings for the home they hope to own someday. As they have been out of college for three or four years and have no dependents, it is obvious that they will be in debt. There is never enough to go around. 
They are living for the rays of tomorrow. And when the family does come, unless a miracle accompanies the children, their standard of living is going to be restricted when the young mother can no longer work. This is the pattern. In patterns of this kind, there is a very thin line of defense against trouble. If everything goes along fairly well, if inflation keeps on, wages go up, these young people will overlook the difficulties of the situation or the dangers that may lie ahead. If the young man is able to keep his job, he will complete his payments on the numerous odds and ends which he is accumulating. But if a serious illness strikes, or there is a bad economic crisis, or if any major tension arises between these young people themselves, uh, the chances of a happy outcome are just moderate. Some of them have enough common sense to bring them through. Others with no patience and no intention to be made miserable for any reason whatsoever will simply break up a home on the first argument. With this kind of condition generally prevailing, the person is not only without inner resources, but does not even dare to seek for them in himself. He has put nothing in. Therefore, what is going to come out? He does not consider any particular resource within himself as any part of the equation of his life. Success and failure de depend upon employment or unemployment. Happiness depends upon having what he wants. Security means that the month's payment has been made. What lies ahead should not even be considered at this moment. When life begins to become more complicated, the person under these conditions is inclined to simply run away. It is astonishing how many husbands run away within a few months of the birth of the first child. Here is a responsibility that they simply are psychologically unable to carry. There are more cases of desertion from this cause than it ever be imagined. Then there is a certain infantilism that comes into this. A young husband is absolutely unable to survive the division of his wife's attention between himself and the child. He has suddenly, uh, to his own thinking, taken a back seat. Uh, this bruises his ego, and he has no sense of paternal pride, no feeling that he has now new things to live for. He merely has new interruptions in the so-called orderly procedure of his own life, which is largely the process of doing what he pleases when he feels like it. The same thing happens to a number of mothers. A number of mothers go into decline with one or two children. By the time the family reaches six or eight, however, they have gathered their resources and have uh, gained certain experiences. If the family goes that far, it'll probably pull through. But these young people, they come to me, the young wife ready for a nervous breakdown. The child has disrupted the pattern of her living. She cannot go where she pleases when she pleases anymore. This is a catastrophe. She has no defense against it. Where no defenses exist for these attitudes and these problems, we are bound to find troubles multiplying and no remedy 
available for them. Escape mechanisms may also be purely psychological. They may take symbolic forms. They all arise from inadequacy. But many of them are not so honest and forthright as the ones we have mentioned. Many are so confusing in their own symbolism that the person himself who is involved does not recognize them. The only way in which a person can really be smart about this is to observe all negative symbols or symptoms that arise in his life and immediately see whether he can relate them uh, to some tensions which have developed in, in an activity or area of his living. Among the more obscure and mysterious escape mechanisms are those which arise in a person to make it impossible for him to do what he does not want to do. This is a very clever procedure, and the symbolism can become extremely obscure. One form, for instance, of escape mechanism is psychosomatic illness symbolism or symptomology. The person who cannot do exactly as he wants to do settles down to a state of rebellion. He decides that if it can't be as he wishes it, he is simply not going to play the game of life at all. He is going to bury himself in some symptomology. He is going to create an escape mechanism of disabilities. All over the nation, and for that matter all over the world, there are tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of individuals suffering desperately from ailments they do not have. Yet in many instances, the symptoms will actually deceive a thoughtful physician. Not being able to change places with the consciousness of his patient, the doctor is not able to estimate all of the circumstances that are present. If, however, an individual suffering from more ailments than there are in the medical dictionary comes into a physician, receives a complete checkup, and the doctor finds nothing the matter with them, organically or structurally or for that matter basically from a functional standpoint. He is almost certain to suspect that this person is building some kind of a mechanism. He is trying to revenge himself upon something or someone. I have known cases where individuals have settled down to the rather monumental task of trying to revenge themselves against God. Now this would seem to be a, a large job, and it is. Needless to say, they are not very successful, but they're doing the best they can. Many individuals try to revenge themselves upon the world. If they cannot do as they please, if they cannot be the hero, as the Duke of Gloucester is reported to have pointed out, they will be the knave. If they cannot uh, gain the confidence of society, they will outrage it. They do not think this through very carefully, sometimes not at all. But the instincts begin to manifest themselves. The person who does not like to do a certain thing may develop illness symptoms whenever they are confronted with this responsibility or problem. The one very common one, of course, that doesn't quite reach this proportion but can be most irritating, is the individual whenever you try to get them to see something they do not want to see, simply becomes nervous. 
When they do not have their own way, they get excited, hysterical, say all kinds of unpleasant things, and frighten other people thoroughly. This is merely one way of getting their own way. No one wants to argue incessantly and continuously with such a type of person. Then we find that very often psychosomatic escapes uh, take the form of the individual running into some excess which is symbolically consistent with his own condition. We mentioned that society is today very largely uh, an area of escape mechanisms. And here is how some of them operate. The person who is unhappy in his personal life, who is not satisfied, whose conduct has been such that he is a failure as a human being, or is too selfish and self-centered to try to fulfill the simple, natural, gracious processes of living, gradually develops an intense success mania. Happy people really do not care so much whether they're the chairman of the board or not. The top spots in human industry and in merchandising and in the professions, in law and in politics, the top spots are many of them held by individuals who are miserable. This may be one of the reasons why things do not run more smoothly. For if authority is invested in an unhappy person who is poorly oriented, naturally the projects will not go well. So more and more the individual who is unable to find normal, pleasant living, doing simple, kindly things, buries himself in some kind of a project. If his home is unendurable, he stays out of it by working overtime. If his uh, various associates do not hold his interest or become obnoxious to him, he plans activities which cuts him away from them. If his pressures become too great, he may not even find success a sufficient outlet. The more miserable he is, the more likely he is to become a tyrant, either in a small way or in a large way. Practically all world conquerors are neurotics, because no one in his right mind wants to conquer the world. It's much nicer to live in it and enjoy it. But the person who is unhappy wishes to find some way to forget himself. Because he is unhappy, he also wants to hit back. There's nothing a miserable person finds more objectionable than happy people around him. They in some way convict him and force him to face the fact that they have something that he does not have. Peace of mind. Escape mechanisms also run to alcohol. The alcoholic is almost always a person running away from something. And while very often the alcoholic will not admit it, it is essentially true. Now there are many persons who wonder why some moderate drinkers become alcoholics and others do not. The answer is pressure. If, for instance, a person drinks only because it is considered socially required, he may suffer from alcohol, but he will not become an alcoholic. If another person, moved by the same original motive, merely to be a social drinker, is under pressure, he will find greater and greater temptation to alcoholism. Alcoholism is simply a phase of man's subconscious 
suicidal instinct. Therefore, nearly all escapes have something of self-destruction lurking in them somewhere. The tyrant realizes that he is in constant danger of being killed, and yet, as a calculated risk, he would rather gain his escape purposes and face this end, as Hitler did in the bunker under Berlin. It was the mere final culmination of the individual running away from himself. And as a symbol of this escape, death comes as a symbol of the escape of the individual from all responsibility and all condemnation or criticism. Most people have been brought up to speak kindly of the dead. And the individual who is subject to criticism, which he may justly deserve, feels that in death he will no longer be criticized. There are all kinds of obscure pressures that influence this situation. Less dramatic, perhaps, but sometimes no less fatal, is the extroversion through power. Perhaps the most common and natural symbol of that is the man with his high-powered automobile. This individual gains a sense of importance. He gains a sense of control, mastery, because he has in his keeping a tremendous machine which can be also a missile of death. The person fighting traffic determined to pass every other car on the road, although he is not going to perhaps get home more than a minute sooner, is actually seeking to gratify the instinct to superiority. And because his normal condition remind him continuously of his inferiority, he finds in this power drive of his car a tremendous satisfaction, a sense of triumph. He feels himself leading perhaps others who are wiser than himself and perhaps too wise to race with him. Everywhere we turn, we see these escape mechanisms. Another one is extravagance. The person who feels that if he spends more, he can spend himself into some uh, state of superiority. He escapes from prudence, from reasonableness, by extravagance. And it's astonishing how often a planned program of economy necessary to maintain a family will end in a sudden burst of extravagance. The individual is unable to retain his sense of moderation. To be deprived becomes to be imprisoned, and everyone longs for freedom. One of the reasons why we will probably have war for some time yet is because war is a powerful instrument of extroversion. The individual who joins up has his little moment of applause. Many motives may impel him. Of course, there is always that draft which is one motive. But there may be others. He may volunteer. He volunteers, perhaps, to escape. To escape the humdrum. To escape a job that will never be very interesting. To escape from the fact that he is not noticed, recognized, or considered important anywhere. But when he enlists, 
The boss shakes hands with him and wishes him well. The boss has never shaken hands with him before. The boss will shake hands with him once more if he comes back. That's when he returns. And two weeks later, everyone will have forgotten him. But if he goes forth with this sense of importance, he is now a defender of his country and a, a stout supporter of democracy, and he's now going to fight the war that's going to end war. It's always been the same. He may pass through terrible tragedies and may never come back. But still he has had his moment, his escape. It was a calculated risk. And he chose the hazardous way. Anything rather than to continue for a lifetime in mediocrity. It was Mussolini who said that it is better to live a few years as a lion than a lifetime as a lamb. And that is exactly what he did. So in all these things, escapes are nearly always poor choices. Sometimes they are wiser where the person, carefully calculating his values, seeks not an escape, but a legitimate release within the area of the reasonable. Hobbies, avocations, new interests coming into life to combat monotony. Because one of the problems that we all face in a highly regimented society is monotony. And against this monotony, there is an individuality in all of us which rebels. So we have to try to find some legitimate outlet. Most of the inmates of our prisons are escapists. And by a strange circumstance, they escaped into prison. This was not how they calculated it, but this is what happened. I've talked to prisoners in many of our state prisons, and some of them, even behind the bars, feel they made a good bargain. <laughs> they escaped from something worse. They escaped from situations which they could not endure. Others, of course, used escape mechanisms because they wished to achieve at least temporarily luxuries, or a social condition which they were not willing to earn, or could not earn. Lured on by publicity, and by very poor social status, uh, standings, they tried to be great for a day. And because their, their rebellion was against society to begin with, they revenged themselves by afflicting society, by attacking it. This vast outbreak of attacks on persons, uh, this rising tide of violence, much of it by persons who do not even know their own victims, represent moving from some compulsion of inadequacy in his own nature. Now, this inadequacy doesn't always mean that the person is really inferior. That is another interesting problem. It means that the person does not believe sufficiently in himself. That perhaps he has abilities but has so negative a personality that his abilities are never recognized and the opportunities which he really deserves never come to him. Very often also ability is housed within a most forbidding appearance. The individual's personality is against him. He is unable to give sufficient sense of acceptance to other people. An outstanding example of that problem was the great composer Mozart. He was a most unprepossessing looking person. 
And although his genius was tremendous, he was never really accepted, as persons of lesser ability were accepted. There was also a tremendous psychic stress in this musician. For while he was a very young child and should have been orienting socially, he was required to pound the piano morning, noon, and night. The ambitions of his parents had a great deal to do with the rebellion and escapism that became in many ways an almost psychotic force in his life. So all kinds of reasons are present. Reasons which come out through other types of escape also. Dreams, visions, and hallucinations. For years we've had an awful epidemic of this in religious movements, particularly those which have a tendency to bring the individual into the presence of mysteries which he cannot understand very well. Uh, the more involved, mysterious, or metaphysical the religion, the more difficulty many people have in approaching it with a, a reasonable type of mind. But we cannot blame the religion in every case, because in most instances, the religion is only a basket or a net which has caught these people. The individual turned to religion as an escape. He turned to religion, as I know some did, simply because it was a legitimate way of being away from home. This just comes down to that. Other individuals turned to religion because they believed that it would give an opportunity for them to extrovert some kind of ability which they had or believed that they had. But this type of extroversion usually got them into difficulty. The pressure within themselves set up symbolisms, and these individuals became subject to various types of symbolic obsessions. They found that all kinds of strange and mysterious things were happening to them. And in a good many instances, these mysterious happenings followed a pattern. And this pattern was that of religious importance. These people developed messianic complexes. Being bound in some rather humdrum condition, with very little opportunity to exercise perhaps a fairly strong ambition, these persons suddenly found in religion an opportunity to become a leader. They could found some kind of a cult or a belief, and no one is so foolish that in time we cannot have at least two disciples. So these people developed little spheres of influence, which were their escapes. And these escapes compensated, perhaps, for poor home life, broken homes, lack of financial means, uh, very drab surroundings, and perhaps not very ingratiating personalities. But after all, much can be forgiven in a prophet. And what appears to the average person to be a bad disposition takes on the appearance of a high dedication when it is associated with religion. So we know that religion really became a scrap basket for escapists. It has always been this way. There's nothing especially new. But it should help us to realize that the cause is not religion. The cause is the interpretation of persons. And this hanging upon religion as a last escape from reality. Now what are all these people trying to escape? In most instances it is some kind of reality. 
You do not do unreal things unless you are trying to escape from something that is just too much for you to carry, or you think it is. Reality is the heaviest burden that most people have to bear, the reality of who they are, and what they are, and what they can do, and what they cannot do, and why they should be proud of themselves, or why there is nothing for them to be proud of. These realities come to an individual who is utterly untrained to receive them or accept them. Most persons have not developed their own potentials as they should have. For because society never demanded it, and because perhaps they were too lazy to be interested in it at the right time, these people drift into middle life with extremely limited abilities, and perhaps with the best of good intentions, but no way of fulfilling any of these intentions. Their advice is abominable, their suggestions are impossible, yet they mean well. They want to help, but for some reason everyone they help gets worse. This is something that psychologists know about, the ministers know about it, the world knows about it. But up to now there has been no standardized program or method set up uh, to cope with the real facts. Churches today are bringing in pastoral counselors. And many ministers are now being educated with psychological courses as part of the curriculum. The theological seminary is going to probably drop a few of those old courses in Americ or something of that nature and try a few courses in social psychology. But actually, while this may help and can provide something, it would seem to indicate that religion has very little confidence in itself as religion. It is falling back upon science. It is taking the same procedures as the non-religious person, as much as to say uh, the needs of these people are not spiritual needs at all. And if the religious person is in trouble, give them tranquilizers as you give them to everyone else. Or send him to a psychiatrist, or institutionalize him, or follow in the same procedures that were set up by a series of somewhat atheistic psychologists 50 or 75 years ago. This does not seem to be a solution. It is not a solution scientifically, so why should it be when the theologian applies the same technique? The answer does not lie here at all. The religious solution uh, to these pressures is part of its own inheritance. Religion is something different. It may have philosophical overtones, but it is not basically a philosophy. It may have scientific elements in it, but it is not basically a science. And where efforts are made to confuse these values, everything is worse off. The contribution that religion bestows upon the individual is a kind of internal reorganization of his standards of living. This reorganization is not in terms of some academic program. It is the individuals coming to face the larger realities of life. What the religion can do for the person is to make him realize the importance of the things he is doing now. 
that the securities of life, the values of life, the good consequences which he looks forward to, are reserved for those who meet the obligations of the day with serenity and insight. There is nothing that we have to run away from except our own ignorance. And there is really no way of successfully escaping that. Wherever we go, we take it with us. Any unhappiness that we seek to leave behind outruns us and gets to the same end as soon as we do. There is no solution here. Religion should set up its own formula to handle all types of neurotics. One of the things that religion has always taught man is the dignity of faith. And that faith, in a mysterious way, is our acceptance of a universal plan a plan which to the religionist arises in the divine will. A plan which is right and proper, whether we like it or not. To stay with the plan and fight it through is to become strong. To run away from the plan is simply to be weaker. If we run away often enough, we reach a state where we can do nothing else. Escape becomes instinctive. We can no longer stop our own feet as they hasten off. Consequently, problems are very often nothing but our own reaction to normal and reasonable situations. In every situation that is natural and proper, there may be expenses, but there are also compensations. The individual who has to give up a little of himself to maintain his home suffers a small loss, but if his attitudes are right, he enjoys a great gain. He finds that in the fulfillment of the natural plan of life, he grows, strengthens his character, and becomes capable of a deeper appreciation of values. The person who is forever escaping is deprived of the joy of the securities of those who stay with it and master the situations that confront them. The individual, for example, who has a natural inborn dislike for work, and there are a good many of them, finds hundreds of reasons for changing jobs. If his dislike for work is strong enough, the employer also finds reasons for getting rid of him. But even if this emergency does not rise, the person seldom stays anywhere more than a few months where he is able to manufacture enough dissatisfactions to move him out of the employment. I know persons who have made a successful career of this. They can boastfully say that they have never kept one job for any length of time during a lifetime. And because of this, and because they remained in a strange negative way their own boss, their own boss meaning the fact that they were always able to quit when they wanted to. These persons believed they had achieved a victory. But they had attained a victory at the loss of all of the securities of life which they should have enjoyed. They never had even the physical things that they might have had. They never had any respect for society. They never developed any orderly habits. The individual who has this kind of a mind, always escaping, usually has a home that is as confused and disordered as himself. 
everything fitted together, this person or these persons simply cheat themselves. They run away from a self-discipline which they all need and assume that freedom is freedom from responsibility when this is not the case at all. Consequently, if a generation becomes too addicted to escape mechanisms, it will weaken the entire social structure. It will cause the person to be so continuously dissatisfied that he can scarcely maintain himself and will contribute very little to any collective purpose or project. He will be dissatisfied, he will be against everything, and most of all, he will be sick. His health will reflect all of these problems, and one of the commonest phases of the escapist's health problem is his constant addiction to health fads. By the time he has to move from one fad to another for half a lifetime, his digestion is ruined as well as his disposition. What do we actually need? We need the thing we don't want to take. Orders. We need to be under the supervision of something that is strong enough to control us. And also sufficiently good to provide us no excuse for rebellion. In this world, there is nothing that can really give us this kind of discipline. A top sergeant in the army can do fairly well. But even such a person has a very limited area of disciplining. And, of course, the soldiers are only waiting, hopefully, for the day when they will be out from under his tyranny. A few of the wiser ones, however, learn to respect him. Mostly discipline has to come from allegiance to some conviction. And this problem of allegiance may require some rather careful thinking. Religion is about the only thing that can really give it to us. And wherever anything else takes the place of religion in giving it to us, that other thing becomes a religion, at least for us. Just as communism has become a religion in these socialized states, it has taken the place of a spiritual allegiance. An allegiance we have to have, and it is best for us if it is an allegiance to something just. The more strength we have, the more we enjoy being strong. There is very little desire to escape from a situation with which we are well adjusted. It is this lack of adjustment that causes the discomfort that makes us run away. Religion has certain things to offer. First of all, it has a tremendous moral force. Like it or not, believe it or not, three quarters of mankind is dedicated to religion of some kind. The Christian, in associating himself with his faith, associates himself with 875 million other human beings. This is important. The royal numbers does not necessarily mean quality. Numbers means weight. It means the fact that the individual is not alone. He cannot regard himself as being simply a crack-brained adherent to something. He belongs 
to a motion that the majority of mankind regards as good whether they practice it or not. In addition to this tremendous body of Christendom, there are enough other religions to bring the religious population of the world to over two and a half billion. And this is allowing a goodly number for the non-believers. Those, therefore, who find some interest in religion do not need to regard themselves as eccentric or gullible. It is only that they need to regard themselves as having the same needs as the majority of other human beings. All human beings need food and clothing and shelter. They also need friendship and faith. These are the essentials of life. Any person who cuts himself off from these essentials is just doing himself an ill service. Now, it's also quite possible that a sophisticated generation growing up at this time cannot accept without question the beliefs of their ancestors. This means that there are progressives in religion. There always have been. Luther was a progressive. Calvin was a progressive. Each of these individuals found it necessary to adapt faith to the requirements of a contemporary world. We may still have to do this. Religions evolve as people do. And a religion that stands still is soon extinct. But it does not follow that because we have to adapt, that we have to deny. It is perfectly possible for the average person to develop a strong religion either within the body of the religious structure of the world by selecting a group close to his interests, or by making the study of religion a valid activity of his own. His own search for faith being a major labor of his life. And in this way, in searching for faith, he is not running away. He is looking for answers. Now, some will say, of course, that religion is itself a great escape. That it is an escape from scientific realism. That it is, a, uh, that it is an escape from a mechanistic industrialism. But most persons who have been religious since the beginning of time have not been escapists. They have been strong in their sense of duty. And religion has strengthened them rather than weakened them. It may have made some of them intolerant. It may have made some of them bigoted. But for the majority, it gave stability. It gave patience. It gave willingness to sacrifice self. And in each of the religions there has been some heroic personality that has arisen, a savior, a prophet, or a sage, whose own conduct exemplified his faith. And these noble examples have benevolently influenced hundreds of millions of human beings in the last 3,000 years of history. Religion, therefore, when it is adjusted by a definite effort of the individual to his own needs, when the understanding of life arises from one of the great systems which have given courage and integrity to the ages, the person has a pretty reasonable probability of gaining a kind of character which will sustain him in his hours of need. He will find inducement of example, of belief, and of living 
inducement to patience, to generosity, to forbearance, to forgiveness. He will find more and more emphasis upon virtues attained and less and less emphasis upon indifference to character. There are a great many cases recorded in which religion has contributed to recovery from mental and emotional ailments. In fact, the present trend in psychology is also a new and divided allegiance. Today, many psychologists, having had many years of experience and countless failures, have come to the conclusion that religion is an important element in all forms of psychotherapy. The individual who is naturally religious is more easily worked with. The individual who has faith in God has greater faith in himself. The individual who believes in religious principles has greater tendency to resist demoralization in his own conduct. We find that where a religious person relaxes, his religion is likely to show. Where he is not a religious person and relaxes, nothing shows. There is no available strength released by relaxation, and yet all strength arises in relaxation. Consequently, we have every reason to feel that religion helps the person to fight it out wherever he is. It has a tendency to protect him against self-pity. Because if he is religious, his perspective is changed. An individual who suffers simply because he is in a situation resents both himself and the situation. But a person convinced that his suffering is the result of his dedication to an honorable cause has a great satisfaction in his conviction that his suffering is advancing him as a spiritual being and that even though others do not recognize it, his keeping faith with God is known and recognized by God. And in every problem that exists, God and man, one man, constitutes a majority. Therefore, what might at first have seen monotony, seen monotony, now becomes dedication. Well, you can say, what's the difference? That dedication is only another name for monotony. And that the individual is fooling himself. It's still monotony. <laughs> There's one difference, however. Whether it is dedication or monotony, if he stays with it, it is discipline. If the impulse to run away causes him to leave his dedication or his monotony, then he has definitely injured himself by any code or attitude he may care to hold. Nobody is better because he runs away from reasonable dedication to responsibility. If, however, he stays with it, from whatever motive he may hold, he is a better person. He has strengthened resources. He also has developed a new sense of the recognition of his own dignity. When this person can say honestly that he saw his duty and he did it, this person has a greater sense of personal human dignity. 
He has more respect for himself. And he also will discover as time goes along that other people have more respect for him. And this allegiance to that which is necessary is the highest status symbol in the world. More than the status symbol, however, it is an essential element in personal therapy. If religion, therefore, gets us over the impulse to be irresponsible, it is worth whatever it costs us in time, energy, or contributions. If religion convinces us that we live in a universe of justice and integrity, and that somewhere there is a principle that cannot be deceived, and that that which we earn must inevitably come to us in due time, which is merely a statement of the law of causality, we gradually become responsible persons. As responsible persons, we expect to make decisions. As responsible persons, we also prepare ourselves more adequately. The individual who intends to live a life of evasion has no inducement to prepare himself for anything, unless it might be a safe place to land when he escapes. <laughs> but the person who is intending to make decision has new encouragement for self-improvement. He has new things to think about more important than the next television program. In his effort to understand life, he has taken on an interest that will outlive him. He can never understand it all. But as he goes further into it, he will become more aware of its sublimity. One of the reasons why we have so many comparatively irreligious people is because so few look under the surface of things. They are not quiet long enough to contemplate life. They have not reached the degree of insight in which they can sit down quietly under a tree and be completely overwhelmed by the majesty and mystery of existence itself. It is very difficult to live close to life without recognizing the tremendous vitality, the tremendous energy, the incredible wisdom underlying all of the processes of existence. So by taking a decision of responsibility and supporting it in every way that we can, by logical argument, by experience, by tradition, by history, by observation, we gradually begin to make sense out of living. We overcome the superficial either-or attitude of the old Aristotelians. We no longer brush off great masses of humanity as wrong or unimportant, we do not take superficial stock of things. And as we begin to think more, we cannot find as many excuses for our own mistakes. The less we think, the more completely isolated we can become and the more we can create an imaginary universe and try and live in it. It always cramps us. So we break through and escape into a realm where we have no experience and no preparation. Escape mechanisms cannot solve things. Because if we escape from a dilemma, we merely escape into another one. Solution never lies in where we are, but what we are. There is no way in which we can run fast enough to get beyond 
that kind of a place where trouble can work. No matter where we roam or wander, or what part of the world we set about to live a hobo existence in, there is no escape from danger. There is no escape from uncertainty or the possibility of immediate responsibilities. We must either accept them or diminish ourselves to condition of uselessness and hopelessness. Religion, then, helps us by giving us what science and even philosophy may not be able to confer. Science certainly cannot at the present time. Philosophy might, but the kind of philosophy that would is not contemporary. You've got to go back to the classics. Because most modern philosophy is generated from disillusionment and is simply another type of frustration. The philosopher is trying to escape by assuming that the universe is meaningless in the first place. Where he is going to escape to in a meaningless universe is not quite clear. Religion still remains as the only dynamic because it is the one thing, one form of, of insight which powerfully stimulates our emotional values. Religion activates our sense of sublimity. It strengthens our realization of beauty. It releases our natural instinct to venerate. It finds its expression in worshipfulness and its peace in the quiet sanctuary. It is a very stable thing, although sometimes it falls into crystallization. But for the person who has never experienced it, it is a very present help in time of trouble. It gives the person the possibility of the quiet, valuable life. And in the long run, the most important thing about living for most people is that while they are alive, they live well. Most persons who have religion have a better record than those who do not, unless they violently and vigorously destroy their own religious integrity. I have known a great many persons who have found in religion the strength for long and useful lives. And during these lives, a continuing veneration, not only for deity, but for their fellow men. That these persons, imbued with the Sermon on the Mount, trying within themselves to continually perpetuate the life of their Messiah. These persons follow some simple injunction. They take up their cross and follow in the footsteps of the Master. They expect a burden, and in carrying that burden with nobility, they sense fulfillment. They have no instinct to escape, for escape would be simply to cast down the cross which their master has bade them to carry. Therefore, to these persons, escape would be the greater ill. Every inducement is to fulfill, to continue a good life, and if the religion is liberal, to continually investigate religious principles so that life may be continuously better and richer. And this fa very faith by which they live, it will be the faith by which they die. It will be the faith also that causes them to pass out of this world convinced of the reality of eternal life. It will give them no need to escape. 
and will gradually indoctrinate them with the futility of evasion in all its forms. Now these people are not miserable. Most of them have upon their faces the quietness of a gentle conviction. They are not constantly living in the presence of mortal sin. They have found a pattern or a rule or a guide. And they are living it according to their own insight, which may make them far more liberal than the faiths they belong to. But they do have this tremendous internal security. If we don't find some way of providing this, we must then assume that the next generation will live in perpetual insecurity, because there is no other way in which we can give security to people. How can we give physical security to a world with a hydrogen bomb hanging over it? How can we give scientific security to a world which has already experienced the dedication of scientific skill to the manufacturing of instruments of death. How can we give industrial security? All we can possibly give is a welfare plan. And we're not sure that we could maintain that. We certainly cannot give fulfillment the only way in which we can give the person a rich life is to enrich his inner life and by so doing help him uh, to use his resources according to a high standard of personal idealism. This realization is his reward. He does not need to escape because he has established a dignified relationship with life already. He does not particularly care whether other people agree with him or admire him or not, because he knows within himself what he does to be real and admirable. And if he has these values, some will admire him and some will understand him and many will respect him. And this is what constitutes his fulfillment from a social standpoint. So I can say very definitely from a lot of work with people that the ones who have made an important religious life for themselves are the ones least likely to be in trouble. And it is the individual who turning from his own self-development to the criticism of other people who is in trouble most of the time. We are admonished not to judge because in whatsoever manner ye judge, so shall it be judged unto you. We are not here to judge, we are here to live. We are not here to depreciate the faith of other people, but to strengthen our own. And this faith is the only way we have of compensating for fear. The kind of fear that makes us run like a rabbit and hide under a bush. And wherever anyone is running away, he is running away from himself. And the only way he can learn to stand up with himself is to develop within his own nature qualities which are admirable, proper, and will bring him his own respect. Thus escape is dependent entirely on which way you want to go. If you want to escape life, forget responsibility, and dive into some form of dissipation. If you want to escape misery, strengthen character, and move resolutely toward the perfection of your own nature. It is not an escape. No one can escape to.
to reality. All motion toward reality is growth, not escape. All motion away from reality is escape, not growth. You can consider this to be a basic formula. And on this basic formula, we hope you will ponder until this time when we have our next lecture.